Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Helena Borholm. Uh, I'm a communication strategist at the Swedish Research Council, and I'm going to be your host today together with Maria Bergström, who's senior analyst at Swedish Research Council. I also want to take the opportunity to wish you all a uh, warm welcome, and also to all of you watching this uh, conference being broadcast live, so you're following it on your computers at home. Maria, mm -hmm. tell us a little about what we are going to hear this morning. Yes, we are going to have an exciting morning listening to the three presentations covering uh, four evaluation, actually. And uh, we're going to listen to see if there has been great merits of these programs or not, if there is some flaws that we are, or something that we would need to avoid in the future. Uh, this has been a sort of a very long program, so a lot has happened during those 10 years. Um, uh, and that's the kind of um, the, the both the difficult bit, but also the, the fantastic bit to have to tell that long framework when you when you do research, uh, and to what benefit that has for the research environments. Um, uh, we will also hear about the recommendations from the evaluators for the eventuality of a future investment in this direction. So it's going to be very interesting to see what they have to say about this. So. And also, um, please follow us and, and comment on, on Twitter, uh, hashtag COE conference this morning. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce our first speakers. Uh, it's uh, Professor Jürgen Mlinek, uh, who is, among other things, former president of Humboldt University Berlin, and Professor Maya Makarov, director, general, director from, uh, of Biocenter. Uh, Finland. Mostly welcome. Give them a warm hand. Warm hand. Okay. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome. We are glad that you made it despite the coronavirus. I think that's a good example how important science can be. We had the climate issue, Fridays for Future. We now have this uh, coronavirus, and the advice from scientists becomes important again. And I think that's a, a good introduction to what we would talk about. Uh, how can a science system be uh, competitive at the global level? What are the ingredients? What is important? There are different approaches, different countries. We will come back to that, I think, later on. Have had and still have um, excellence uh, initiatives. The question always is what comes next? Will this be brilliance initiatives? And, and then what comes after the brilliance initiative? Everybody is excellent now, what's the next step? We can have a lengthy discussion about what this really means, excellence. I think it's essentially all about people. That's my conviction. It's at the end all about people. But of course, you also have to have the right mindset. You need the right structures. And at the end, you also need some <coughs> resources. You need some money. So Maya Makarov and myself, we had the pleasure to share a panel to look uh, at this Linneos program that you have set up. And I think we can already say right now, Maya, big applause to Sweden for this wonderful program, do it again. And I will, <laughs> will repeat it at the end of our presentation, do it again. And we will elaborate uh, a little bit more on it. We, we have somehow divided the presentation. I will uh, start with a short introduction. Uh, so uh, Sven already talked about the purpose of the evaluation. After 10 years, I think it's really good to um, have a critical review, whether it worked or not. There were some challenges. The challenges were twofold in a certain sense. 
the program ended already a couple of years ago, point one. Point two, the people that we met in our hearings, we had quite a number of hearings, not always had first-hand personal experience from the Linnaeus program. But we had some pre-evaluation and we had a wonderful team headed by Maria and colleagues to uh, support us, to organize everything. And maybe this is uh, the right moment now, Maria, to thank you and your team very much for having done this. Now, this is the international uh, panel. It's uh, essentially European, but also Europe is uh, international. The UK is on board, you know. I mean, this is a first hint that we are really international. And some of our colleagues from Great Britain, they really enjoyed spending their last days of their, you know, professional <laughs> career in uh, mainland Europe before leaving the <laughs> European Union. They the explicitly day. mentioned it also in the dinner speech. You remember? Yes. Maya. Okay. So I think we had a wonderful panel um, and we were distributed um, among two groups during the hearings. One was headed by Maya, the other one by myself. We always came um, together. We had a good representation, I think, over the various areas, uh, humanities and social science, engineering, natural science, uh, biomedicine. And I think we also had a good mixture of people bringing in really uh, competence in the disciplines, but also institutional knowledge, which I think helped a lot to come up with the report. In the hearings, and we had hearings with all universities, so we learned something about all the 39 centers. We always asked, was everything you want to bring on the table, on the table? So we really made sure to hear from our colleagues in the hearings, <coughs> do they have some messages for us, what went well, and especially at the end, we always ask, what would be your recommendations for a future program? Now, these are the four main evaluation questions. Has the Linnaeus grant um, led to establishment of sustainable research environments? Uh, have the uh, higher education institutions strengthened their ability to prioritize and profile? What about the societal relevance of the research and has the Swedish research system as a whole become internationally more uh, competitive also in terms of visibility and attractiveness? And I hand over to Maya that now goes through the results and then I'll be back with you at the very end. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good morning also uh, on my behalf. Uh, why do we panelists take on board such a huge task? Well, of course, to contribute, to be able to help if we can. And in this case, of course, the entire Swedish uh, research, higher education ecosystem, uh, ecosystem and the Wetenskapsrådet and of course the government. But the benefit, of course, is that one learns. And I think that all of us panelists learned a lot, and that's, that is extremely valuable. Thank you for the very kind invitation to do this. So my task here is now to go through very quickly the evaluation results, and I will crystallize them in a very, very short way. So uh, we will look, be looking at the capacity building at the university level, at the institutional level, the capacity to host, to build up and host a center of excellence. Then I will talk about research performance of the Linnaeus centers themselves, the individual Linnaeus centers. And then finally, I will go through the societal relevance of research that was performed in the individual centers of excellence. Thereafter then, Jürgen will take over and go to the conclusions, lessons learned, recommendations, and finally, he will give the clear answers, yes or no, to the key 
questions. So let's look at the capacity building at the university level, at the institutional level. The criteria were as follows. So a capacity as an institution to host and develop a center of excellence, which is not a faculty, it's not a department, it's a center of excellence. Uh, building up, what about the performance in building up the center, in closing down a center, and what about then continuation of all this capacity that has been uh, uh, fostered and built in a center. Then uh, renewal of science, that's extremely important of course and one of the prime goals of a center of excellence. What about the support functions that the university had put in place to support the centers of excellence and what about the quality of management and leadership at the institutional level, at the university level. Then what about uh, uh, the use of the Linnaeus grant by the higher education institution in profiling its own research activities? Was there any selection of areas? And what was the, the motivation and logic behind it? In this case, uh, had the centers of excellence an impact on these eventual choices? And what about enhancing of international visibility of the university? And then finally, the impact of the program of the centers of excellence on the university's uh, research portfolio at large. So let's now go over to number one, capacity building, uh, the host institution. And uh, our task was to single out three top universities, not ranked, three top universities against these criteria that I just went through. This was an immensely difficult task. Uh, we came up with this, and I repeat, this is not a ranking. So we have Umeå University. Why did we single out this particular university? Because uh, it supported the development of its centers and it was involved, the university management was involved in, in a very strong and positive way in the building up of the Linnaeus centers. Uh, there was international world cross recruitments that, that uh, uh, the centers uh, catalyzed and the university supported. The university uh, supported very strongly uh, uh, the centers, for instance, with a plan of continuation. And this then enabled excellent research, world-class performance of those particular Linnaeus centers hosted by Umo University. Then we singled out Linköping University. There was a very close connection with the university leadership and the upcoming centers. The university management monitored the Linnaeus Center's performance closely, and this enabled the centers to be very successful and develop sustainable research environments. They attracted a lot of external funding and also funding from the university. The third one, Uppsala University, a strategic approach towards the Linnaeus Center's not a grant, money, and let them do what they want, but really a strategic approach. A strong focus on developing academic leadership in the centers, and then a very tight connection between the Linnaeus environments, the research that was performed in the centers with education. I should mention uh, also the Swedish Agricultural University. We tried to push forth university into this group, but we were not allowed. So I wish to mention this particular university as having performed very well at the institutional level. So then let's go to the research performance of the individual Linnaeus centers. And the criteria here, scientific excellence, using the long-term funding, the 10 years funding, to really focus on high gain, high risk research, to achieve breakthrough results. Uh, the degree of interdisciplinarity, intensity of knowledge transfer within academia in the host university between the generations, 
of, of researchers. Success uh, of PhD and postdoctoral programs. And the volume and quality of international recruits. So again, uh, now we go uh, uh, through the three uh, singled out centers of excellence uh, per uh, area of research. And uh, again, this is not a ranking between those three. So in the natural sciences, I'm sorry for the acronyms, but the na names are extremely long and I'm sure that you uh, identify most uh, of them. So let's look at natural sciences. The top three Linneo centers were Linne QS in, in uh, at Chalmers, uh, ICE3 in uh, the uh, Swedish Agricultural University, OKC in Stockholm University, thereafter Engineering Sciences, Nano QE in Lund University, Access in KTH, Flow again in KTH, Medical Sciences, CERIC in Karolinska, LUDC in Lund University, UCMR in Umeå University, Humanities and Social Sciences, Lin CS in Gothenburg University, HEAD in Linköping University, and SPADE in Stockholm University. And then finally, Social rele uh, societal relevance. Now it has to be noted, I'm sure that most of you know that this was not a criterion when the uh, applicants were screened, when the uh, winning centers were, were uh, uh, chosen, uh, but Wetenskapsrådet wanted to add this as a pilot to have a visibility on the uh, benefits for society of research performed in these Linneo centers. So the areas that uh, where the 10 universities and their Linneo centers excelled in the context of societal relevance were many. Industry relevant research, new products, new materials, new treatments and diagnostic tools, patent applications, patents, spin-off companies, academia industry collaborations, new teaching methods, outreach to society and citizens, and finally, informing policymakers and providing science advice for decision makers. So the three top uh, Linneo centers are here. Again, a breakdown according to area of research. So in the natural sciences, Supra in Chalmers, CMEB in Gothenburg University, LLC in Lund University, in engineering sciences, Nano Q, uh, QE in Lund University, Access in KTH, Upmark in, Univers uh, in Uppsala University, medical sciences, CRISP in Karolinska, LUDC in Lund University and UCMR in Umeå University, Humanities and Social Sciences, LINCS in Gothenburg University, HEAD in Linköping University, and SPADE in Stockholm University. Now, what is the national impact of, Lin of the Linneus program taken now together all these three categories that we examined, the performance, of the institutions in capacity building to host CEOs, the research performance of the individual uh, Linneo centers, and then the societal relevance of the research that was performed. So we can clearly make the conclusion that uh, all three universities and the 39 Linneo centers feature in at least in one of those categories. So, so we can really say that, uh, that uh, the, the impact of the Linneus program is nationwide, which I'm sure is a very gratifying result. Now I hand the instrument over to you, Jürgen, to continue with the conclusions. Thank you very much, uh, Maya. Conclusions. And maybe I just display them all. As I already said, we were really impressed by what you have 
achieved and um, why? Relatively low funding per Linneo Center has had strong impact at center, university, and national levels. I already mentioned there are a number of excellence initiatives going on in Europe uh, all over the world. If I take, for example, the German example, it's 500 million euros a year, 500 million euros a year. But of course, Germany is a factor of 10 larger by population than Sweden. Now, 40 Linneo centers here would mean for Germany 320 Linneo centers in Germany. But we only have 50. This means in Germany, the funding per center is much higher. Still, you achieved a lot with a much lower funding. This was about 600,000 to 1 million euros a year. Why? Because it was long term. We always heard this 10 year period was really critical because this allowed the researchers to come together and also work on bold, risky projects because they knew we have the funding for 10 years. Even if it's not 10 million a year, if it's only 1 million or 600,000 euros a year, we have it for 10 years. And second point, we can use it in a very flexible way. That's what we always heard. Long-term, flexible use, lean management, uh, quality assessment, yes, but you know, lean. So this was one point. The other one was that um, the Linneo centers acted as catalysts for bringing researchers together that otherwise would not have collaborated. And that's a general phenomenon, you know? I mean, uh, money always acts as some kind of oil and glue. It helps doing, you know, new things together with other colleagues um, that you won't do otherwise. So this was a catalyst because we also found out that in many cases, the major funding of a Linneo Center came from other parties, from external parties. Which brings us to another effect. The Linneo Center had some kind of snowball effects. Over this period of 10 years, and then even after this program stopped, the centers were able to get additional support from either the EU or foundations like the Wallenberg Foundation. So there was the snowball effect. I think. That's probably the main, the main uh, conclusions. High risk, high return, breakthrough projects because of the long-term flexible use of money, catalyst, you know, uh, uh, performance, oil and glue, and, uh, and uh, lean management. Now, of course, there are also some lessons learned. The Linneus program has not contributed to the university's research profiling or their strategy at large. We really discussed this, and I'm looking at Maya at length when we came together in our panel, is this good or bad? Of course, at the beginning, this was one intention. But what we also learned was, to our surprise, that many of the universities had between 20 and 50 centers. That's amazing, we thought, 20 to 50 centers. And we often asked, do you have a strategy at all? We were not sure whether the universities had a strategy at all. So the Linneo centers played a role, you know, as one piece in the overall activities of the universities. And you know, I was running a university myself and then an even larger research organization in Germany. As a university president, of course, you like to take money in, 
But what you don't like is that people from the outside tell you what you should do or have to do in your institution. And that's always a touchy issue. So I think we tried to be fair in that respect. There are some comments on this in the report, by the way. I hope everybody uh, has uh, one copy of this. Came out very nicely, Maria. We are proud of it. <laughs> so that's one thing. The, just, the host universities have not used the Linneo Centers for Institutional Branding. A lost opportunity. To my shame, this was different for uh, Maya, I didn't know about this program when I was asked to share the committee. Now you can say, okay, this ignorant guy from Germany, I mean, come on, you know, if Sweden's setting up such a great program, he should know it. I didn't know it. And maybe you should think about making more out of such an excellence program. I mean, why, why didn't you let the world know that this is going on and this is, you know, just wonderful? Uh, the co-funding was something, Maya, where, where we had a really controversial debate, I can say, in, in, in our committee, because there was a co-funding required. But again, what does this mean? Does this mean cash on the table? Are these in-kind contributions? Does this mean 20% of the working hours of a PI or whatever? So it was unclear. And you will see in our recommendations, you somehow have to deal with it in a more concrete way, or you just skip it if you go for another probe. Lack of knowledge sharing between Linneo centers. There was no meeting to our surprise of the Linneo centers to exchange you know, experience. Again, we thought a lost opportunity and maybe there could be also uh, have been more collaborations between uh, higher education institutions. So, so this were the lessons learned and these are our recommendations. Uh, do it again, as I said, congratulations. Uh, if you do it, have open courts for any discipline, maybe on a rolling basis. I think one problem this time was you had, I think, two courts and everybody knew that it's over after 10 years. Maybe it's better to have, let's say, rolling cords and then not, you know, 40 at once, but, you know, distributed over a longer period of time, which would also mean that the program should go on longer than uh, for 10 years. Proven excellence of research as a criterion for a grant. Don't compromise for quality. Don't compromise for quality, because if it's an excellence program, it's an excellence program. And um, look maybe for emerging fields. Don't spend the money of already existing research silos. Go for emerging fields. Look for maybe more interdisciplinary activities. Stay with a long duration. I think, and we thought, this is really great. 10 years, that's great. High degree of flexibility, what concerns the use of the grant. I already mentioned this as a strength, uh, appropriate level of funding. Is 40 a good number? Do you want to have more? If you have more than even 40 with a given budget, the, as we call the dilution factor increases. And then maybe your activities become subcritical. If you have less than 40 centers, there is more critical mass per center. But then, of course, you have a discussion in your country, why only 10? <laughs> Where we have so many good activities going on. So you have to balance this. Also in view of the budget that uh, is available. And we thought at the end, 
if you somehow continue in the spirit of the present program, something like maybe 150,000 euros per PI would make sense. That's not huge, but it's sufficient over a long period of time to start both projects. And then you have to discuss, do you want to have a minimum number of PIs for a proposal and so forth? This then would, you know, somehow fix the overall amount of funding per center activity. So in summary, Has the Linneus grant led to establishment of sustainable research environments, fostering international competitive research? Yes. Have the universities strengthened their ability to prioritize and profile? No. Have the centers led to research that has societal relevance? In many cases, yes. I think the centers were really serious of making an effort to become societal relevant in the sense that Maya explained. And has this program given uh, uh, your system more international visibility? Yes, especially in terms of recruiting people, young people, PhD students and postdocs, but also faculty, but mainly young people um, at the international level. I think this was really a great advantage of the program. So Maya, I think you agree, do it again. Congratulations. And we are looking forward to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Do we stay here? No, we can sit on the front. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen and Maria, for your thorough work and for your very interesting presentation. Good work. Um, we will now move on to our next presentation. Uh, and that's the second uh, evaluation. It's going to cover two evaluations. This time, we will hear about the Center of Excellence program called the Berzeli and the Vin Excellence. And the evaluations are made by Vinova. We welcome the two evaluators from Lund University who will present their evaluation of the Baselian Wien Excellence Program. We have Dr. Anders Hulme, who has a PhD in sociology, and uh, your research profile is mainly in research policy and sociolog soci sociological theory, I think it's called. And we have Professor Mats Benner, well known to most of you here, perhaps, uh, a professor in science policy studies at Lund University. And you are also the vice dean of Lund University School of Economics. Uh, true, true. True. And uh, you are a well known. As we well speak, at least. As we, yeah, yeah, I don't know, after speak. the presentation. <laughs> yeah. maybe it's... And a well known <laughs> expert in research policy matters in Sweden and Europe. Uh, so, welcome. The stage is yours. Thank you so much, Maria. And to, to quote another famous German, uh, here we stand and cannot do otherwise. God help us. Amen. Um, so you've heard from the uh, European jury. Um, and now you will hear from the Scanian jury. Uh, and one take home lesson that at least I got from the earlier presentation is the fewer centers you have, the better. Uh, so this maybe speaks in favor of our mother university when it comes to the effects of the Wien Excellence programs. <laughs> and it also maybe ascertains our, that we don't have a, lack, a conflict of interest given the small presence of Lund in this program. So anyway, we will speak about two um, uh, center initiatives that developed in some parallel to the Linnaeus environments, but as Joran Marklund mentioned, at least one of them <clears throat> has a prehistory that, well, depends on how far you want to go back in history, but at least in the early 90s when, when the US model of engineering research centers were sort of tried and emulated in a Swedish context. So the two, let's see if I can. Well, that's just the outline. You forget about that. So the the first of the the first of these uh, 
these initiatives uh, is what was in the, its first iteration called competence centers. Then it was changed according to the excellence discourse of the 2000s into win, win excellence. Um, and uh, the objective was rather different. I mean, similar and different, same but different as compared to the Linnea Center. So if you look at the third bullet point, it pinpoints a rather complex, an array, if you like, of goals in which scientific impact certainly plays a role, internationally competitive, yes. Uh, highly qualified experts, yes, uh, but the focus is more on, let's say, problem-oriented. I think the terminology of the 2000s was needs-driven, behoves-motiverad forskning, needs-driven research. So the focus was more on sort of tangible or at least in a long-term perspective, tangible knowledge interests in society. Whereas you have been looking at science fiction programs, dealing with things that we don't know, that we don't know, that we don't know, that we don't know. Uh, so whereas this was more kind of at least known unknowns, or to some extent unknown unknowns, but a, a kind of straddling between the two. Um, and uh, as you can see towards the end of this magnificent, uh, gigantic quotation, uh, the emphasis on, let's say, tangible outcomes in the terms of new products or processes or services, eventually leading to what was also at the time called sustainable growth, holbar tillväxt. And this was sort of, again, in, in aligned with the Linnaeus Center's 10-year program <clears throat> uh, with 7 million Swedish crowns per year, but also with the Vinovan formula of 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. So the idea was that Vinova supplied a third of funding, seven million per, years, uh, per year, and then uh, universities would provide another third, and then partners would provide the third third, so to speak. And uh, I mean, there were evaluations also of the Linnea centers, as we all know, but I mean, these were rather of a rather detailed and recurrent manner and rather interventionist, if you like, the, inter the evaluations that were done during the course of the program. Uh, the second initiative that we've been looking at is a sibling, small sibling, the Berseli program, which is kind of a bridge between the Linnaeus programs and the in excellence programs in the sense that they were intended to pinpoint groupings that were had the kind of the scientific profile of the Linnaeus environments, but had the potential of becoming providers uh, or important underpinnings of important societal sectors. So this was a kind of a test balloon. Uh, I don't know whether it was shot down or it just disappeared into outer space, but it was tried once, and four centers were identified under the banner of being a, a Berseli center. And we ended up, and we will not enter the alphabet soup that you so successfully managed to, uh, so we will just list all of the centers. I mean, basically you can say that the first generation of Vin Excellence centers had, uh, were primarily or exclusively oriented to areas of transportation uh, and working life, whereas the second generation had a more kind of mixture, primarily em emphasizing information technology, biotechnology, materials. And then there was one call, as I mentioned, on Berseli centers, and it was a combination of plant science, uh, one in brain research, and the other two, I give it the word to you, whoever they. Um, uh, in, uh, um, uh, sorry, I forget. Yeah. The, the last, yeah. yeah. Um, so that that's the kind of the composition of the <clears throat> of the initiative. So now we move on to how. Uh, what has been done before and how it was sort of conducted this time. And I give the word to Anders Hulman. 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, so before uh, presenting the, the previous studies that we are doing now, I would like to say a few words about what we already know. Uh, as has been mentioned here already, the, the VIN Excellence and partly the Berseli programs, they build upon the, the Competence Center program started by Vinova's predecessor, Newtech, in 1995. Uh, with just very slight variations. The Competence Center uh, program was thoroughly evaluated during its lifetime, and there has been, as Jöran Marklund uh, already mentioned in the introduction here, uh, two impact analyses. Uh, the first one was done in 2004, already before the 10-year program ended. Both of these analyses came up with very positive results, and these results directly played into Vinova's decision to continue funding under the new name of Vin Excellence Centers. So just among the, the many points that these uh, impact assessments mentioned uh, is that they seem to be successful in, in uh, reaching their objectives of creating strong research environments of uh, high international quality and visibility. They created uh, exactly this form of new uh, interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinary networks and industry collaborations so or collaboration with industry and university researchers, which was the, the purpose of this program. And not least, the, the Competence Centers program in Sweden functioned as an important role model for what was then quite a new organizational form in the university system. Um, and not least through the training and, and the building of competences for academic leadership, where Newtech and later Vinova organized uh, leadership training, for example. Um, the second impact analysis focused on long-term industrial uh, impacts and was uh, published in 2013. And uh, among its conclusions is that they, the centers were very successful in producing new prod products and process innovations that were immediately uh, adopted by the partner uh, industries. Uh, they also led to, to uh, behavioral uh, changes in industry, so increasing the research capacities at companies. So learning to collaborate with university researchers, gaining access to networks, uh, easier access to the research front, and uh, learning to collaborate in new ways with, uh, with innovation, basically. Um, it seems like, according to these uh, assessments, all the, the, the parties, so the, the funders, uh, the host institutions, and uh, uh, not least uh, the participating partners, were quite satisfied with, the, with this program and how it worked. And, among one of the things that was mentioned by the industry partners is that it gave them increasing access to, to uh, personnel with relevant training. So both PhD students, but also undergrad students with the, the relevant competences that uh, these industries felt were needed. And looking at the purely economic impacts, which is very hard to estimate for, for I mean, the, the impacts of participating in a 10-year program and calculating that in, in, in monetary terms. But according to this uh, impact analysis, uh, and the most moderate uh, estimate is that this, the whole program with 28 centers generated at least 1 billion uh, of, of savings and revenues for the partner companies annually. So basically, it was a very good return on publicly invested money. There we go. So the study we're doing now takes a slightly different approach, uh, since we already know quite a lot about this competence set center format. So this study that uh, Mats and I are doing now, that is ongoing, takes a more qualitative approach to the effects of this funding format, the, the competence center uh, and the, the Berseli center format, and, and ask basically three overarching questions uh, in this project. Drawing on 
the recent research and theory in, in uh, research policy analysis and sociology of science. So we ask, what, of course, what are the forms of impact of this program with a focus on the organization of research? So, so what impact has it had on uh, collaborative networks, on researchers and research programs, uh, universities, and of course, uh, participating partners? So, I mean, one uh, basic idea of the whole Center of Excellence uh, instrument is that the, the time horizon and the volume should allow for, for more daring and more uh, visionary projects that wouldn't be uh, possible otherwise. So we hope to be able to contribute at least slightly to understanding how does this come about? When does it work and when does, does, what's the condition for, for this to work? basically. So this is about explaining the variations in impact over these different centers and understanding what, what processes, mechanisms and actors leads to, to the desired outcomes. And the third question is uh, more of a meta question where we take a, a broader grip on this program and study the program in a historical context, the, the development of the program family, we should say. And also look at Vinova's quite special mode of working with evaluation and governance of, of these centers. The, the data we're drawing on, uh, there is, uh, as we've already mentioned, a lot of previous evaluations and reporting from the centers. Uh, we draw on archival mat material, interviews with Vinova and uh, uh, some VR staff. We will use bibliometric network analysis and uh, the main part of the study will be uh, in-depth case studies with qualitative interviews at some of the selected centers. And some of these major parts all lie ahead of us now. So I want to, to really emphasize that this is an ongoing study. And today what we're presenting are very preliminary observations. And uh, so the final report will be delivered in a year from now. And regarding these preliminary observations, um, some observations about what we think are characteristic of, of uh, successful center collaborations according to the previous evaluations and according to the, the um, interviews with the funders we have made already. First of all, there seems to be a clear role for strategic planning in successful centers. So, uh, as was mentioned here in the introduction, creating a, a, a 10 year center, drawing together maybe in the order of magnitude of 50 researchers, 10 different partners consisting of uh, different university departments, small, medium sized, large companies, maybe public sector organizations, drawing these diverse and heterogeneous actors together finding some common ground and developing, developing this as things changes over time seems to be, be uh, um, um, seems to require that that one works with clear strategic planning so formulating early on common aims for the projects updating these as one go and and creating realistic strategic plans for how to achieve these common goals and of course, this requires uh, strong and clear leadership and organizations of the center. And this is, uh, seems to be quite an um, uh, important feature of the, this center format. Uh, leadership here means uh, what the, uh, the evaluators uh, focus a lot on in the successful cases seems to be uh, center center managers with a, a clear mandate and a, and a clear aim uh, and sort of strong leadership role and a formalized uh, organizational structure not least uh, with a center board and the third point is the importance of involving the partners at an early stage in the process um, one way of doing this is that is to include the partners in the center board so that the, the all the participating partners are active in the decision makings of the center. Um, 
we can see that some of these centers, as was mentioned previously here regarding the linear environments as well, some of these centers, they are already part of a much larger research environment. So one can ask then, what does it add more than quantitative list to add just another center grant here? And it seems like, at, at least in some successful cases, that the, the requirements of this center format to have this formalized and clear organizational structures and strategies adds a sort of organizational backbone to a sort of a, a big research environment that, that uh, can sort of survive and create some sort of organizational backbone for attracting further funding and so on. Um, involvement on partners uh, is also central to this form since the idea of, of this needs-driven basic research is that it, it is uh, basic research done at universities, but the, the formulation of research projects and research programs uh, should be according to the needs of the participating partners. So it means that, that the partners need to be involved early on to formulate the needs and interests and to find common interests and synergies. Um, and one part of the organization and involvement on partners uh, is uh, furthermore the use in these centers of a clear formal agreement between partners uh, regulating not least intellectual property rights. So having these things settled at the very start seems to, to uh, provide grounds for a, a sound structures of collaboration. Um, a fourth point here is the, the use, uh, which seems to be something that the successful centers do, uh, of early on setting up an international scientific advisor board. So basically, a set of internationally re renowned researchers within the research fields that act as a, 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 an internal peer review system to provide feedback and support, linking up with, with the research groups internationally and so on. And the fifth part here is uh, the integration of education, not least of PhD training, and integrating PhD students into these industry collaboration networks and um, sort of making the PhD training or the PhD students uh, experience working with industry researchers and sort of that organizational logic and getting access to industry networks. Uh, and thereby also providing industry with, with competence later on. Let me now turn to the role of evaluation and reporting in, uh, in this center format, which is uh, quite important. Uh, as was already mentioned, these centers are evaluated by uh, international uh, panels uh, at three times during the lifetime, so roughly two, five and seven years. And each stage of the funding is conditional of, of successful evaluations. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, uh, uh, something that requires the center to fulfill the, the program goals. We have uh, a few cases of centers that have terminated funding uh, because the, these goals were not uh, in all ways fulfilled. Um, but we can also see this uh, in a slightly larger picture as part of a process of active learning, support, and governance by Vinova's way of running these centers. And here, learning means that the Vinova staff attempts, and quite successfully it seems, to, to learn and due, over the years accumulate quite a lot of practical knowledge about performance, the workings, development, and management of these centers. So it's sort of quite unusual, I think, for a research funder to have this sort of hands-on knowledge of how these centers are run and, and function. Support means here that one of the intentions of the evaluations is to, to uh, I mean, beyond mere control, to provide recommendations and support, drawing on this pool of ex international expertise with, with uh, knowledge from similar centers internationally in order for supporting centers to develop and reaching their goals. Uh, and governance, of course, means that this process is also, also directing research in a certain direction to fulfilling the, the program goals, uh, mainly through the use of evaluations. 
And here we can see the evaluations as a form of soft governance uh, with very much a focus on, on what I've mentioned already, strengthening organizational and collaborative forms and, and strategic management. And this works very much, I think, through the very detailed recommendations that the, these evaluations give and the follow-up in, in the next evaluations on how these centers have acted on, on these recommendations. And finally, I think uh, we can say that in these programs and in the evaluations, it's important to point out that the view of excellence here is only one among several complex uh, program goals, as much, much mentioned initially. Uh, we can perhaps talk about something like a threshold view of excellence, where, uh, I mean, the requirement is, of course, a, a high international uh, level of uh, scientific quality in the output of these centers. Um, but it's not only a quest for excellence here, it's something else that, that's required. We have some cases of centers that seem to be very scientifically excellent, but fail to integrate the diverse uh, actors and more uh, seem to be a, a, like a collection of diverse small projects that doesn't find these sort of synergies and so, which are the goals of the program. And taking a, a yet slightly broader perspective, um, we have uh, already mentioned here that uh, the VIN Excellence Program and partly Berseli is part of, a, of a, the Competence Center family. And as uh, Jörn Marklund mentioned in the introduction, the Competence Centers also draw on previous experience by Vinova's predecessors, Newtek and STU, drawing back to the 1980s, perhaps the 1970s. Um, of a certain ex Swedish experience of funding uh, environments in technical research. Um, and here we can see that the, the, these funding agencies have worked through developing these models, models uh, with evaluations from quite an early stage and sort of learning and developing these models. And the competence center model, at, as it was established by Nutec in 1995, was part of an international establishment of, of this uh, format as a recognizable form, where actually the Swedish competence centers were role models for other centers uh, in other countries. So this means that, that there is now an international experience of this type of center format and this type of goals. And it also means that Vinova can today draw on an international pool of evaluators that are familiar with the ideas of this type of program. Focusing instead on the reception side among researchers, we can also see that there seems to be a historically developed reception capacity for this quite special type of grants uh, with something like an understanding and appreci appreciation of uh, a certain way of working, uh, expectations of what this format entails, and not least uh, established the required networks between university and industry researchers, uh, which brings with it a, a competency for successfully attracting this type of center funding. We can see this, I think, in a certain continuity in center constellation. So we have some of these centers that have survived from one generation of competence centers to another. Uh, I think if I'm not wrong, today we have seven competence centers uh, uh, running today that came from earlier Vin Excellence or Berseli Center environment. So we have this constellation of, uh, of uh, research industry networks that are have sort of um, uh, understood the way of working and, and created competences and so for this. Um, of course, there's uh, uh, these programs are focused on technical research areas, and we can also see that the centers are um, heavily focused uh, or located at the technical universities, which is not so surprising. It seems also perhaps that it is uh, a model that is quite the, the threshold for for breaking into and uh, being successful with applications from other research areas, perhaps lacking these collaborative networks, is somewhat harder. So 
in conclusion, what we see here seems to be a, a certain institutional path dependency that where we have a, a model and some form of mutual learning between uh, the funders, uh, the research, parts of the research community and parts of industry, uh, which seem to have adapted to and uh, start, achieved the appreciation of working with this model and learned to do that. Um, yes, I'll leave the word to Mats. Thank again. you, and I will use the last couple of minutes, there you go. hopefully in a wise manner. Uh, <clears throat> Well, I mean, this uh, why the European jury can uh, soon leave Stockholm uh, head held high, heads held high. Uh, this this jury is still out, so this will be sort of a more of a in media race conclusions. But uh, I mean, if we try to sort of zoom back or zoom out to a more general level, you can say that. Well, as an observer of Swedish science policy, and I'm pretty sure you have a much more sophisticated discussion in Germany and Finland, uh, but it sometimes uh, brings to memory Kipling's old saying that West is West and East is East and never the twain shall meet. Uh, when you look at the discussions of universities and funders and their interrelations, it sometimes well, on the one hand, it's the, uh, let's say, the um, sleeping beauty metaphor that uh, universities are sleeping princesses that await the prince's kiss from the funders. Or from a university perspective, it's sometimes Gulliver being tied down by the Lilliputs. Uh, so universities are constrained by all of these meaningless or more or less meaningless interventions from smallish, short-sighted actors. So uh, whereas we think, and I draw, I infer that from your presentation, that there's actually a rather large latitude for universities, enlightened active universities and let's say funders with stamina that can actually set long-term goals and steer, but steer wisely. Uh, to actually conjoin efforts over extended periods of time. So these types of instruments, when they work well, and they don't always work well, we've learned that, and that's also in our material, and you need to be clear and sharp when it doesn't work, but when it works, it provides an example of where you have environments that are driven by visions and integrations and people that keep reminding members. I mean, I, I was once a participant observer in a project group where the project leader constantly had to remind the participants in which constellation they were. So in this very multiple funding systems we have, we need leadership that actually can remind what are we doing? Who are we? What are we doing? And we find ample examples of that in, 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 in our material, despite the fact that the goals and the composition of both participants and interests are, are quite complex. But it requires an open dialogue and discussion about goals and means and ends, and also from time to time, a more or less fair jury that comes in and gives its verdict. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Anders and Mats, for this presentation with very many thoughts for the coming discussion that we will have later on and the many th great things that you've noted in your uh, ongoing evaluation. Uh, the final presentation, uh, this session, the evaluation now that's going to present it, is the Forte Center of Excellence. Uh, and uh, please welcome Professor John Solomos, He's a professor of sociology and head of the Department of Sociology in, at the University of Warwick in the UK. Welcome, the stage is yours. Thank you for welcoming me uh, to this uh, event. And uh, I will represent the views here, not just of myself, but of um, 
the group of uh, assessors that uh, did the evaluation of the Forte Centres of Excellence uh, back in 2018, uh, who consisted of researchers from both the UK, uh, Holland, uh, Finland, uh, Germany, and, um, and Denmark as well. So we had um, an international panel to evaluate the Forte Centres. Um, and although the UK is no longer part of the EU, I, 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 I and colleagues at Warwick University and other universities do see ourselves as part of a wider research culture. So I, I speak to you in that spirit. Now, linking up with the other centers and the discussion of the other centers, the Forster Centers of Excellence go back in history to um, 2006 when there was a call for centers announced in a way fitting in with the story that you have heard about the other research um, uh, uh, calls. And the kind of core areas of Fortis responsibility lie in areas of health, uh, working life, and welfare. And the centers were invited on the basis that they would uh, complement and work in those broad areas of uh, Fortis uh, concern. And the the invitation um, was made on the basis that uh, also another important thing to mention is that another element which links up with what has already been said about the other centers is that the host university would fund in, in kind and in, in, in money 50% uh, of, of, the, of the cost of the centers over the life of the centers. Um, so the Forster would give um, 50% and the other 50% would come from the university, the host university. Now, when we made the call for funding back in 2006, when Forster made the call for funding and the evaluations were made, there were 29 applications. And of these 29 applications, there were 10 successful centers. And they focused on a variety of areas uh, ranging from issues like aging, um, alcohol, inequality, uh, public health, working environment, and also a relatively interdisciplinary and new area of research relatively on um, international migration and ethnic relations. So we funded centers um, across um, different universities, including the Karolinska Institute, Lincoln Pink University, uh, Lund University, uh, Stockholm, and Umer University. The 10 centers were based across those universities. Now, when, when, the, when the centers were developed, they were developed on the basis both of um, the competitive environment in which centers were asked to bid for funding but also the applications were assessed by international um, uh, scholars who had some knowledge of the fields in which the applications were being made and who had competence in a way to assess them, but also to uh, develop a kind of idea of the international positioning of the research groupings. So the kind of granting of those 10 centers and the kind of um, in that competitive environment was based both on the kind of position of the different research groupings which were applying for the funding, but also some kind of international evaluation in which uh, there was a competitive kind of element. In addition to the funding of the actual centers, Forte then in, um, in 2012 also issued a call for funding of um, um, PhD uh, studentships in the form of research schools. Uh, which were aimed largely, but not totally, at the centers. So there was, in addition to the funding of the centers, funding for research schools for PhD students. Over the 2007 and 16 period in which the centers functioned, um, there was um, 533 million uh, funding from Forsha. Um, and the co-funding of the universities consisted of about the same 525 million over the period of the funding of the, of the centers from 2007 to 16. 
In addition, of course, and this has been highlighted already by the other uh, presenters, the center has received a lot of other external funding um, from within uh, Sweden, but also um, including the Swedish Research Council from Vinova, but also there was funding from the European Research Council from other, other bodies outside of Sweden as well. So in a way, the kind of idea that has already been spoken about by some of the other presentations, um, that the centers would also be um, a focus for bringing in not just funding uh, from Forsche and from other uh, funders in Sweden, but also internationally, was part of the, um, the kind of focus of the centers. Now, in our evaluation, which we completed in 2018, we did, I think, generally agree with the kind of broad idea that the centers had um, been a success in various terms, particularly the terms about impacting on the kind of international reputation of the research groupings, highlighting the role of Sweden as a center for research in key areas of research um, that were funded by Forte, highlighting also the quality of, um, of the work that was done by the research centers, but also the links that were being developed with uh, the wider international research cultures. So in that kind of context, I think one of the issues, of course, that is important to mention is, is the kind of um, the way in which we thought the centers, not, not always, I think, all the centers, but at least the vast majority of the centers, were able to um, bring together not only uh, experienced researchers, lecturers, professors, but also to bring together uh, younger scholars, including the PhD students that I mentioned. And also we found that the, the centers were able to uh, deal with such issues as the gender diversity of research and those kind of questions as well. Now, in terms of the kind of long, longer term arguments about having such centers and some of the kind of other presentations have already addressed elements of this, so I won't dwell on all of them. Um, but in, in, in the context of discussions about the kind of the impact of the centers and the kind of longer term impact of the centers, I think that the kind of the scientific impact of the centers can be seen particularly strong in terms of um, the recruitment of um, younger researchers, both men and women in this context. It was also important that the centers often prioritized and encouraged interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research. And in addition to that, of course, they were often working in areas where Sweden had some reputation already as a leading center for research. I mentioned before areas such as aging, areas such as working uh, life and environment and health, where there has been both before and after this Forte Center has already a strong reputation of researchers in, um, in, in Sweden as having a strength in this kind of areas. But I think in terms of the kind of longer term impact of the centers that Forte funded, um, I think we thought when we did our evaluation in 2018 that we could highlight at least a number of key areas um, where the, the funding format of 10 years of relatively stable longer term funding, which would allow universities and institutions, um, higher education institutions more generally, to, to prioritize research that was particularly um, a, bit, a bit more longer term than project funding research. Um, that one of the crucial elements of our report was that the provision of a longer term perspective was import an important outcome of the funding of these 10 centers. Also, I think the risk-taking element, which has been mentioned already, and the crossing of disciplinary boundaries was important for in terms of the findings of our research into the centers. And linked to that, there was the issue that 
often the centers and the kind of institutions themselves, the universities, the higher education institutions, um, prioritize the importance of having a critical mass of researchers uh, to develop areas of research that were important, not only for uh, the universities, but for wider society, both in the context of Sudan and in the context of other societies as well. So the kind of the, the, the feature I mentioned already of linking some of the funding of the centers to also the funding of research schools struck us as also valuable in the sense that it did develop training programs for PhD students and also allowed for the kind of development of, of, uh, of new generations of scholars, perhaps, that were uh, already crossing disciplinary boundaries. Intellectually, the kind of focus of the centers on, on, on areas of research, which cross disciplines often, which allowed bringing together of different scholarly communities was important. But also, I think, increasingly within the context of the evaluation we did in 2018, after the 10-year period of funding had finished, we saw that there was perhaps the biggest consequence of the funding of the STEM centers is that there the was clear evidence that national inter, international visibility of the research uh, centers had come to the fore. So one of the kind of um, advantages we thought of the funding around a 10-year model, although it had the disadvantage that it fixed funding over that 10-year period in these 10 centers, is that it allowed those centers that had been set up to develop um, and take some risks uh, to develop interdisciplinary kind of questions and research in their areas and to allow for um, a longer time frame than is usual in project-funded kind of research. Now, some of the centers um, that we evaluated in 2018 um, also linked themselves to longer-term projects and, 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 and departments within universities. Others were perhaps more uh, seen as shorter term and uh, perhaps more linked to the model of a center that wasn't exactly linked to longer term ideas about research. But I think the kind of, um, the context I think in which the 10 year funding was provided did allow for the emergence of um, perhaps important not only important areas of research, but also methodological and other collaborations with researchers, both in Sweden and internationally. So in terms of looking back at our evaluation, including the midterm evaluation that we did um, before the final eva evaluation, I think perhaps one of the kind of emphasis that perhaps looking back we would make is that rather than perhaps in the future funding centers on the same kind of model, there should be some more emphasis during the existence of centers on providing more uh, direct advice about the profile of centers internationally, nationally. So evaluations perhaps should be not so much aimed at the final evaluation, but there should be somehow uh, attempts to develop the profile of centers during their period of existence. And so the evaluation process would perhaps be seen as not just focus on a midterm and a final evaluation, uh, but also I think on, on developing some kind of model of continual advice for centers during their, during their period of existence. We did think generally that a 10 year period was quite good and, and longer term, uh, funding has advantages, um, but I think one of the dilemmas that we saw is that higher education institutions differed quite significantly in their um, in their commitment to what happens after the funding from Forster finishes. So although many of the um, higher education institutions were very focused on supporting developing research after the Forster uh, funding had finished, others were perhaps less consistent on that kind of point, and there will be perhaps issues raised about that in thinking about the future. I think 
in the context of another another issue that came through our evaluation is that it's important perhaps not to think of um, centers just over a 10 year period, but to encourage universities and higher education institutions to think what happens to centers after the funding is finished much more. And this is certainly something that um, came across in the kind of interviews that we did with both senior and junior researchers in the centers, that there was a concern to think through what happens about the future and that often uh, concern was expressed to us in when we did the final evaluation about the continued commitment uh, to the funding of the centers, the development of the centers once forced funding uh, was finished. This does not mean that I think we should perhaps th be thinking that funding should be more permanent, but there should be a, a, at least a dialogue between um, Forsche and other funding bodies and universities about next steps once centers reach some kind of conclusion of their initial uh, funding period. And I think particularly um, when it came to the issue of what happens to the various um, PhD, postdoc, other researchers who had been encouraged to collaborate and to work with the centers, um, in a way, um, much of the future of these researchers would depend on getting more external funding. Um, and part of the issue, of course, is, is that um, the, the, the funding sources about in the future were not always that clear. So although in our, in our evaluation, I think we did generally come out very favorably in the, in the final report about the actual funding format, the 10-year scale of the format, and the kind of um, the role of the centers in developing uh, the kind of international visibility of research in key areas covered by the 10 centers. And there was a lot of evidence that this had happened, in, both in terms of um, the publications record of the centers, the record of centers in gaining other external funding and recognition for their research, and those kind of um, uh, criteria. Um, and in that sense, I think we could in all honesty, when we did our evaluation, come to the conclusion that with, with one or two relatively uh, small exceptions, the centers were a success and achieved many of their initial and midterm and final goals. Um, I think there is the kind of issue about how one matches up center of excellence mode of funding with more funding forms in the context, for example, of the, the context of centers that had developed particular reputations. There's also the issue of funding for projects and also funding for new generations of scholars in the future. So the longer term impact of the Forster centers that we looked at, the term that we looked at, um, I think the kind of success of the centers lay a lot, I think, in the way in which they did achieve many of their original objectives. They did encourage interdisciplinarity, improve publication, particularly in international journals and other internationally recognized um, publication forms, such as books uh, by international publishers, etc. cetera. Um, there is the kind of issue, of course, about what, if one assesses the centers, has been largely a success, which we did in our report. I think it's also important to look at what happens um, in the context of the conclusion of centers. When centers conclude, does that mean that the kind of areas of research uh, are no longer important? In many ways, of course, this is not a sensible question to ask because many of the areas of research which the centers covered are longer term areas of research, which have important societal as well as social scientific importance. Um, so it seemed to us important to think through the different modes of funding, including future centers of excellence, but also to think about the role of higher education institutions and the way they could actually facilitate um, the kind of development of centers of excellence within within their institutions, both through fu funding 
by Forster and other funding bodies, but also um, uh, how they could uh, facilitate in their own kind of future plans about, about the role of the university and the higher education institution. Now, I think one of the areas which we thought could be improved upon was that, they, and this has been mentioned, I think, in one or two of the previous um, presentations, is that there was relatively little dialogue between centers and a sharing of experience, a sharing of, um, of the kind of uh, uh, the learning processes by which they could uh, perhaps, although they were working on different substantial areas, they could collaborate in some kind of areas to find out what they could learn from each other. We thought that that would be important in the future. And also, I think perhaps in, in the future, if there is such a form of funding as centers of excellence, there needs to be not exactly a heavy-handed approach from Forster, but more dialogue between Forster and the centers about their development, their objectives, mid-term objectives, final objectives, and longer-term ambitions. I think in terms of a particular area of concern for us as the external evaluators, in a way, is the kind of process by which centers' funding tails off. Perhaps there could be a process by which in the final period of funding, there was a clear idea about next steps, or at least more discussion about next steps between Forster and the higher education institutions. What happens to early career researchers in that process? Now, as I said already, there is quite a lot of evidence from our evaluation about the international impact of the funding in the sense that the publication record of the centers the kind of center's um, record of attracting um, scholars who were able to publish internationally, both in books and in highly reputable journals, uh, both in Sweden and internationally, um, can be seen as an, as an important success story. And also, I think there is a way in which um, the centers have been able, if you take their areas of specialism, not only to um, develop Sweden's reputation as an important um, locus for research in those areas, but also to increase collaboration with other researchers outside of um, uh, Sweden in Europe, and also in some cases more internationally as well, which has been an important outcome of, of the funding of the centers by Forster. So I think, although one wouldn't judge a center just in terms of this aspect of the international evaluation of, of its work, I think we, we thought that it's important that uh, in general terms we found uh, in our report that there are many um, points of advantage to the funding of the centers, but perhaps there are crucial areas to still be discussed about the balance between funding for centers of excellence and other forms of funding, the discussion about uh, what happens to centers once funding is finished, and what are the kind of dialogues that go on between funding bodies and universities about the future of the new generations of scholars who have been trained often in these centers, but whose future is not always clear, or at least it's not clear to them. It might be clear perhaps from an outside perspective, but for the many of the younger scholars that we spoke to, it wasn't clear to them. So our report, I think, was in general, and it ties up with some of the other um, comments we, we heard from the other funding bodies, um, that the initiatives were uh, successful, and there are many pros to the funding of centers of excellence, but there are also issues uh, to discuss, questions to discuss, and um, areas to perhaps think about how it can be done better in the future. Thank you. Thank you.